Well, a happy new year to everybody and I hope you're all doing okay. We're currently going through some difficult times because we're in lockdown too, but I'm doing my best to try and make this film as carpy as I can by setting up the old HQ bivvy behind me in the back garden. It's uh, proper freezing at the moment. It's only two degrees, so we're up in Yorkshire, but uh, at least I'm not too far away from the kettle because the, the house is only a few yards away from where I am now. But like a lot of you guys watching this, over the last few days I've been busy sorting my fishing gear out and going through old pictures, etc. And one of the things I came across was an old box of slides that's just been gathering dust in the corner of the loft. So I decided to open that box up and start scanning a lot of those pictures and uploading them to my social media pages. And one of the things I also came across in this box was an old DVD that was shot in 2003. Now I've not seen this footage for a long while, and once I put it into the computer and started watching it, I thought, yeah, this would make great footage to stick on my YouTube channel. It's um, from Cassie in 2003, and it was filmed by myself and Len Gerd and edited in 2003 and released as a DVD. So once those DVDs were all sold, that's it, the footage is lost. So it's never been on YouTube before. So uh, with me not having been on the bank over the last few weeks, I've decided to upload it to my channel and uh, hopefully it will be of uh, some entertainment to you guys out there. I know there's a lot of people that like fishing on caching and like watching film from yesteryear etc and I'm sure that this one's going to go down really well because there's some great guys on it. There's um, myself, Frank Warwick, uh, Steve Briggs and Bob Davis and it was filmed in July 2003 and it's perfect for anybody that wants to go and fish some of the big waters on the continent because there's some great information in there that's just timeless and there's some great footage as well. Now I must say that the actual quality of the film isn't as good as today's high quality HD footage that you see on some of the films. It was filmed on a 720 camera so it's a little bit pixelated in places so if you wanted to watch it all the way through then I advise you watching it on either one of your mobile phones or your tablets or a little small laptop computer rather than a desktop computer or a widescreen TV. But anyway, here we go. You join us now in the north arm of the Great Cassian in 2003 where I'm sat talking to Steve Briggs. I hope you enjoy it, guys. Well, here we are then, mate. We're in the north arm. We've mm -hmm. been here for three days and so far we've caught some nice fish, just over 30 pounds. The north arm in itself is a lake. It's, it's massive. It's probably, I don't know, five or 600 acres. You fish Cassian quite a bit. Why are we fishing the swim that we're in? Just explain to the viewers a little bit about your, your watercraft and what goes through your mind when it comes to choosing a swim on a big water. Well, obviously, swim choice is the most important thing on any of the big waters. Uh, I'm used to fishing casting a bit more than the others, I suppose. Uh, there's two things. One, the water's a bit low at the moment. Um, it does change the carp's habits. You know, they're more likely to come to the deeper water. When the water's low, they're more likely to come up the North Arm. The North Arm <coughs> is the deepest section on Cassin, is it? Yeah. It, it's the deepest part of the lake. I mean, you've got depths of around up to a, about 150 foot out here. Um, we're, we're not going to be fishing those sort of depths, and we haven't been. But the carp are drawn to those sort of depths. Um, so that was the first thing we had to look at, you know, coming to this part of the lake. Then we actually come to the swim choice in the North Arm. Now, we'd looked at the other side of the lake and we quite fancied that, didn't we, you know, right. over there. Um, but that was where everyone was, you know, everyone was on that other side of the lake. And sort of, you know, we could have squeezed in there, but at the same time we looked at this side, there was no one here at all. Uh, and one thing about the Cassian carp, they do like to get away from angling pressure and angling lines and everything. So we looked over here, there was no one here. Uh, we came over and, and give it a go. And, you know, and a lot of it is trial and error, unless you can see loads of fish jumping and you know, you've been tipped off where the fish are. Uh, a lot of time it's just trial and error, isn't it? You mm -hmm. know, if you see something you fancy, give it a go. Now you talk about the Cassian carp responded to pressure. It is a big water, it's 1,200 acres, but have you sort of found the same sort of pattern on, on the larger waters that you fish, which is Shanty, which is 12,000 acres? Well, I think uh, pressure affects carp the same on ev every lake, you know. Any lake you fish, eventually they're going to respond to pressure. Um, I mean, you talk about Shanty Cock and Exactly that, you've got two miles of bank where night fishing is allowed, and you've got 48 miles of bank where no night fishing is allowed. And of course, everyone goes to the night fishing areas, don't they? And, mm. uh, over a period of time, you know, those night fishing areas get harder and harder and harder. Mm. And a lot of people are now turning to the day areas to get a bit of action. Uh, much the same as, as we've done here, you know, we've, we've come here when there's only day fishing allowed for much of the time, uh, and had our best results that way. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the pressure's off the carp, uh, and they respond much better, you know, they're more willing to sort of pick up their baits and easier to find. Mm. And there's obviously, like you say, 
less pressure. I mean, I've come to cash in a few times now and there's 100 bibbies on the water. Yeah. And, and now there's probably only a dozen anglers on, on the 1,200 acres. So it's not particularly difficult to catch them at the moment, is it? There's also an advantage in watching what other people are doing and reacting accordingly. Well, I mean, one of the things I always try and do, especially on here, uh, is try and find a quiet bit of the lake. I mean, there's things that govern sort of swim choice, like we've spoken about the deep water when the water's getting lower and things like that. But the same thing, you know, try and get away from the pressure. If, if the North Farm looks the best place, but it's absolutely mobbed out with anglers, and the south arm's empty, I'd go to the south arm mm -hmm. because the, the fish always try and get away from the pressure. Mm -hmm. so. Now, you talked about depths, you talked about 120, 130, even, I think you even mentioned 150 foot here in the north arm. Yeah. Um, to me, when I first came to Cashin, you know, I was absolutely blown away by it because, you know, I'd fished quite large waters for what I thought anyway, you know, a couple of 300 yeah. acres and stuff like that. I'd even fished shanty, I think, before I came here. Um, but shanties are, are relatively shallow water all over the lake. Yeah. Um, where do you put baits in 130 foot, you know, 140 foot? I mean, you said they don't feed that low down, but what are you looking for? You know, visual features or well, it, plateaus? It's, yeah, I mean, it's it's funny thing, really, because I remember talking about fishing up the North Farm here before to you, uh, and when I was talking about where I was fishing, like down a ledge, and you sort of say, well, what's there? Is there snags? Is there features? You know, <laughs> I mean, what's there? And on the Echo Sounder, it looks like there's not much, but... Yeah. On these sort of waters, a lot of the time, the depths are the features. You know, the fish aren't necessarily looking for tree stumps or rocks. Uh, they, they find a depth that's suitable for them. So, you know, for instance, out here, we, we've caught a lot of the fish between about 30 and 40 foot this time. Mm -hmm. um, and that is the feature. That's what you're looking for, that depth. You're not looking for a big rock to put a bait beside or anything like that. Mm -hmm. If they're in 35 to 40 foot, then that's where your baits have got to be. They'll find the bait. Uh, but that is the hard bit to find. Yeah. That's, that's the, the key to unlocking it all. Yeah, it's getting it into your mind that there's your single bait just on a rock face, will the carp find it? You know, if you're blanking, you could go through a confidence crisis. I know I have done it in the past, because you are looking for weed, you're looking for tree stumps, you're looking for something, but in, in reality, you don't really need to, do you? You're confusing it for yourself. It's yeah. very simple fishing waters like caching when you can locate the depth of the feed net, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's two parts to the location. I mean, there's the location on the lake as a whole to find a swim in the first place that mm. holds fish. But then you can have a swim full of fish, mm. and if you're not fishing at the right depth, you ain't going to catch them. Mm. Uh, and I, I've seen it time and time again on here where someone are, are being a swim, and I know they've got fish in front of them, mm -hmm. and they come over and, or they move off, and they say, oh, uh, you know, there was no fish there. Mm -hmm. And someone will move in and fish it right, mm -hmm. and have a load of fish because they've just got it right. I mean, you can be 10 foot out, mm -hmm. the fish can be at 50 foot, if you put your baits at 30, 40 foot, you mm. might not get a run. You yeah. know, it's as difficult as that. Okay. Now we've seen this, this trip, we've seen a lot of fish showing over very deep water, um, especially during the day. You know, they've been topping but we're over 100 foot of water right out in front of us, and then they're moving in during the night. Is that a regular pattern to cash in fish? Yeah, I, I think it is. You know, I mean, it's where they go and rest. Mm -hmm. Carp aren't feeding 24 hours a day. Mm. Uh, when they're not feeding, they'll go out over deep water. Mm -hmm. It's where they feel safe, they feel happy, not getting bothered out there. Uh, when they feel the need to feed, they have to come in. They've mm. got no choice. Um, I mean, they, they've been caught down to about, I suppose, 70, 80 foot mm -hmm. at times. I've never caught a fish deeper than 60 foot. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, you can discount the 100 foot, forget that altogether if you want to fish and it's 40, 50, 60 foot, then that's not very far out here. Yeah. So you've got to wait for them to come to you. Right, it's normally in the night is when they come in, is it? Uh, yeah, generally speaking it is. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it can be any time, but um, mostly nights, I suppose, yeah. Okay. We've mentioned that the Cassian carp come in really close and you don't need to fish it at mega distance. And it is really the classic example, the classic water to use as, a, as an example, that on big waters you don't need to fish at massive distances because most people who've never been on the big waters in France or the European big waters, they all have this perception that you need to fish at 300, 400 yards, don't they? Well, it is what a lot of people think, you know, because they see a big piece of water in front of them, they think all the carp are going to be miles out. Uh, I mean, this is a prime example of where carp will come in close. Uh, most of the, the, you know, the edges, they, they go off so steep here that, you know, whatever depth you fish, it's going to be fairly close. Um, but you get a lot of weed beds around the edge. Um, not so much now, the water's down a bit now, but when the water's high, you get a lot of little 
uh, weed beds around the edge, and, and carp will always come and visit those mm -hmm. looking for food. But it's the same on any lake. Uh, you know, I mean, we spoke about Shanticot, and that's a typical example. There's a lot of big lakes like that. Uh, I mean, as a general rule, when the water's down, when it's low, the fish don't tend to come so close. Uh, yeah. But if the water's high, like springtime, when the water's up and it's close into the trees, uh, carp are just inquisitive. They come and investigate the margins, no matter how big the lake is. You, yeah. you will find them in the margins at times. It doesn't yeah. have to be all that mega range just because it's a big lake. Mm -hmm. So what, what about the staple diet of the fish in these big waters then? You know, in England, the staple diet of the carp is, is mainly bloodworm, small shrimps and mussels Snails and stuff like that. Be, yeah. What about yeah. in France and, you know, in the European waters, what sort of foods are they generally feeding on? Well, I mean, most of the natural food in these big waters is, is either swan mussels or it's crayfish, you know, yeah. crayfish predominantly. Uh, and I mean, that affects where you'll find the carp for a lot of the time. You know, if that's their natural food, um, you've got to look to the places where crayfish, swan mussels are likely to be. Swan mussels are, are normally at a certain level in the water. Crayfish, more likely to be in the margins as well, mm -hmm. which will attract the carp in under rocks and so forth. Um, but I know people, you know, you look at this lake and it doesn't look a particularly rich lake, uh, but because of the crayfish and the mussels, They've, they've got a wealth of food out there, mm -hmm. really, and it's, it's all they need. You look at all these steep banks and stuff like that, and to me, it blows my mind thinking that a carp will find a boilie, one single yeah. bait or you know, half a dozen baits at a depth of 20 foot. It yeah, blows my mass. mind away that they'll find that in such a massive water, but they've got to go rooting around for all these, these yeah. crayfish and stuff. So yeah. it's, it's no different for them to, you know, to, to find that hook bait as, is, as it is to find a, a single crayfish yeah. under a rock, is it? It's exactly what they're used to doing. You know, like you say, I mean, you see the bank around here, it's, it's a mass of rocks. Pieces mm. of rock, big, you know, small, the whole lot. And if they're looking for a crayfish, the crayfish are going to get yeah. under the rocks and the carp have got to get them out. So yeah. if your boilies under a rock a bit, then mm. it's only what they're used to doing anyway. Yeah, really. they do plenty of rooting around. Yeah, I mean, it's strange to think of it like that, but, you know, we, they pick it up, so that's what they do, they're digging mm. it out. Mm. Yeah. Now, the one important question I think people ask about big waters is what effect does the wind have on it? Cassian, as you can see, the north arm is very, very long, the south arm is very long as well. If you get a wind blowing from the, the south to the north, you're going to get a big wind. Do the fish I'm not just going to talk about casting here, but in your experience of fishing all these big waters, do the fish predominantly follow a wind on a big water? Well, I think the story with the big waters is the bigger the water, the bigger the wind's got to be to move them. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, like here, yesterday, we had quite a strong wind blowing from south to north in the morning. Uh, and someone did ask us, you know, do we think that that would be enough to move the fish? Well, by the afternoon, it had changed completely around and was blowing back the other way. Mm -hmm. Now the water this size, if they wanted to follow the wind, they'd be going to and fro, they'd be worn out, wouldn't they, by yeah, the end of the day? Yeah. They'd be losing all the weight what they was gaining just <laughs> swimming around all day, wouldn't they? Yeah. Uh, and it's just not going to happen. I mean, I mean, the thing, what will happen, uh, one, if you get a really big storm, or a big, I mean, we've got a bit of a storm brewing here, so yeah, we yeah, are. who knows what's going to happen. over there. <laughs> yeah. um, but like a storm and a big wind might move the fish a great distance. But if you get a normal sort of big wind, what it might do on a big like lake like this, it might just move them around in this section of the mm -hmm. lake. Uh, and we found that at Reduta, for instance, you know, you might be in one big area of water, which mm -hmm. is a small part of the entire lake, uh, and a, a south wind would move the fish over to yeah. that bank, and, you know, and if it changed around the north, they, they might go across to the other bank. But in general, they're not going to move that great a distance unless it's a real, real big wind. Mm. I, I must say that... I from my experience of fishing the big waters, Reduta is a classic example of where when the wind is blowing in one direction, there will be carp at that end. Might not be straight away, but within yeah. a period of say 12 yeah, hours or so, there'll, there'll be a true. lot of fish boshing at that end, won't there? But it doesn't move carp from other parts of the lake, does no. it? You know, I mean, there's fish that are resident, yeah. say in World Record Bay, for instance, yeah. and say Shepherd's Cottage Bay might mm. be a mile away, and the fish don't move from that area to this area. Yeah. Um, it might move just fish around in that section, in mm. that section over to one side or the other, but mm. you know, that's about it, isn't it? You've just touched on a, a, an important topic, I think, and that's resident fish. Small waters in England, we all know about, the, you know, Basil's Bush on Yateley and other similar features where one particular yeah. fish comes out continuously from one area. What about big waters? Is, is it pretty much the same? There's, you know, certain areas of a lake um, say the North Arm is where you will catch the biggest fish at Cassian or certain swims that will produce certain fish. 
Well, yeah, I mean, you know this as well as I do. Yeah. That, um... I know, but I'm interviewing you. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right then. We both know that all these lakes uh, have got resident fish somewhere yeah. around. All the lakes we fish, it's normally the big ones as well. The bigger yeah. they are and the older they get, the more they don't like to travel about, I suppose. Yeah. It's all the, the youngsters like you, you know, like whiz, whizzing Me? about I'm everywhere. still young, 33. <laughs> Whereas us oldens. Got you know, a few like grey hairs coming, <laughs> mate. But no, I mean, they do. I mean, ever since the start of this lake, mm -hmm. the big, old, original fish have always seemed to like the top end of the south arm. Now, mm -hmm. why that is, I don't really know, but it's yeah. just, it's a fact, you know, and the bigger fish always seem to come out from there. Mm -hmm. um, there, There is resident fish up the north arm, but not so much. I mean, it, mm -hmm. there's always fish up the north arm, but on any lake you go, there'll be some resident fish mm -hmm. in certain areas. The bulldozer at the Orient. The bulldozer at the Orient, yeah. One fish always gets caught from one swim. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Gerardo Bay, doesn't it? Strange. It, it, it takes some believing, but, you yeah. know, I mean, that is a lot of the big fish, you know, it's hunting, it, it's finding out where they live. Yeah. You can find out where they live. And, all right, you might go to a place like the Orient, there's five or 6,000 acres, yeah. targeting one fish. How do you do that? Well, you find out where the fish lives. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, it's not five or 6,000 acres, mm. it's 100 acres. Yeah. Because that's where that fish is going to be. Yeah. It's all about doing your homework, isn't it? How important is, is depth then on these big waters? Because in England, everyone generally goes to the deeper parts of the lake in the winter. Now, is it a case of fishing 150 metres or 150 feet at Cassian in the winter, or is it something completely different? Well, it's a good point about the depths because, I mean, one thing they're critical on all of these waters, uh, finding the right depth is, is the key to getting action. Um, I mean, it's more obvious on Cassian here than it will be anywhere else on any other lake, just because you've got greater depths than most other waters. Uh, but it doesn't always work how you think it's going to work. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, we're coming up to sort of September time now, and that seems to be when the fish go to their deepest levels. Uh, when the water's heated up all summer, um, you know, they, they've obviously got warmer water at deeper levels and, and they go down 50, 60 foot mm -hmm. all through September and October, feed at those depths quite comfortably, um, you know, and, and feel quite happy down there. And funny enough, it's as it gets colder, you get to December and January, the fish come right up in the water. So basically it's, it's a reverse of what you've got in England, isn't it? it it's a reverse of what people believe. I, I mean, I suppose you do find it in England, they go deeper in the winter. Mm -hmm. um, here, they definitely do go shallower in the winter. Um, I've noticed it when I've done long sessions, you know, on here, going through December and January. Um, you might start getting fish at sort of 25 foot, which is quite a common sort of depth to catch them here in the winter. Um, and as it goes on, and the weather might get colder towards January, they gradually come up and you'll have a job to get a fish over 15 foot. Mm -hmm. You know, literally the, the fish are just in the upper levels, which makes sense when you've got deep water. Um, the upper layers are the ones that are gonna get warm through the sun. Mm -hmm. So you find them in the margins around the reed beds, on the shallow plateaus, mm -hmm. um, all the places that are gonna get a bit of sun and mm -hmm. gonna warm up a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And as they get too much sun in the summer again, you know, they can go down deeper. Mm. Just talk about plateaus because plateau fishing at Cassian is important and I know it's also important on a lot of other big waters. Um, the word plateau to me when I first came on Cassian, you know, I know, I know what a plateau is but yeah. I wasn't uh, aware of how important it is to find the highest point of a plateau. Just mention about the importance of, of them. Well I think it, again it depends on the time of year. Um, you know the plateaus, I mean people I always think of a plateau like an underwater island. Mm -hmm. You know, you go out and you find this hump that comes right up. Well, here you talk about plateaus as just some sort of ledge. Mm -hmm. Out here, you know, you might have a ledge that only it goes down to 40 foot and then mm. drops straight off to 70 foot. Well, mm. it's, it's a bit of a strange thing to call it a plateau. Yeah. But it is here. Yeah. The fish basically come up and then they just go over the top of it, don't they? It's yeah, like passing or, or areas. They, they use it to follow. Yeah. I mean, the ideal situation is where you've got an old riverbed. Mm. I mean, Reduta springs to mind where you've got a riverbed that runs the entire course of the lake. Mm. Now, in the springtime, May or, or June, the fish are going to travel along the top of the riverbed on, on the actual top ledge. Mm. Uh, and that's always where you find them, in about 8 to 12 foot of water or something. They're always around that depth. Mm. But as you get later in the year, September and October, they still follow the riverbed, but they follow it down the bottom. So mm. you start finding them in 18 and sort of 22 foot. Mm -hmm. uh, and you try fishing the top, you don't get no action. You know, that, those mm. depths are so important. But 
they do like routes to follow. You know, mm -hmm. they'll follow the edges of plateaus, they'll follow the edges of riverbeds. Mm -hmm. um, but you've still got to find that right level within that feature, if you like. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's still so every little bit is like a little jigsaw putting it all together. But yeah. once you put everything together right, you know, you, you get a result. Right, we've spoken a, a little bit about boats before, it forms an important part of the fishing. So we go through what we have in here uh, as a general rule. Um, start off, we need power, got a set of oars obviously, uh, but we also use an electric motor. Now, petrol motors aren't allowed on a, most of these reservoirs, so we have to use an electric motor. The battery we're using to power it is a marine battery. Um, reason for that being, it just does the job better than, say, a car battery. They're, they're designed to release power at a slower rate and they'll last longer. They're just made for the job. Engine itself, now there's various ones about. Um, what I would advise is something with a thrust power, because that's how they're gauged, something with a thrust power above 35 pounds. Uh, just to combat the wind, you know, it can be quite hard going on a big water when a wind gets up. Anything below 35 pounds thrust power, you might be struggling a little bit. Uh, echo sounder, always want an echo sounder in the boat. You have to check with the rules because you're not always allowed to have them in the boat all the time. Um, but I, I use one as much as possible. You never know as much as, about a swim, you know, you just need to learn all the time. So I always keep that in there and have it switched on all the time I'm moving about. Bait, I've always got a bag of bait in here. A little bucket of pellets as well so that you don't have to think too much. If you get a run in the night or something, you need to go back out in the boat. You don't want to get out in the boat and find out you've forgotten something, you have to come all the way back. So it's always a little bag of baits and a little bucket of pellets just for that purpose. Now, landing nets. This landing net, you might notice, it's got a shorter handle. Now that's, that's purposely like that. Reason being, play a lot of the fish from boats, use it for that purpose all the time. Um, it's not until you try and manoeuvre a pair in a boat that you realise how much difficulty you have with a long handle. All that is, short handle, it just makes it easier. There's no problem in that in a fish with a short handle like that. It just makes the whole job a lot easier. Of course, once you netted the fish, you need to get back to the bank. Some people like to hold them over the side of the boat. Uh, it's not always easy. If you're rowing, it's virtually impossible. So, always have a hooking mat in the boat as well. And all you do, lift the fish out of the water, onto the mat, get back to the bank, safe as anything. One last thing, life jackets. Now these aren't compulsory, but they are advisable. Um, I, I'm a confident swimmer, so I don't always wear one, but I do always have one in the boat, because you never know, big wind can spring up out nowhere. You can be moving about on the lake and all of a sudden you could get into a little bit of trouble and it's always advisable just to have one of these and you'll be safe. And there we go, that's just about all you need. We're all equipped to go out and fish and get a whacker. Let's just touch on baiting strategies because you can either put a lot of bait out or you can put a small amount of bait out. Obviously, there's certain tactics that are best suited to certain water, Steve. What about casting? It's a very deep water. Is there something that's particularly better on this venue? 
Um, well, I mean, it is different to a lot of waters, but Cassian in particular, I've never found it that good using a lot of bait. You know, I've tried big uh, beds of bait in the past, and I know people have had some success with it, but for the most part, I've done better by, you know, using a, a little and often approach, just say 20, 30 baits at most, every time I drop a hook bait, just add about 15, 20. Uh, and I think the key to it is here, you're trying to supplement with the natural food. You, you know, you can't compete with the natural food. You've got the crayfish and mussels. Um, and if you're putting your bait in around the natural food, they're going to be picking both up, which, you know, you find in the sacks. You find the swan mussel shells, crayfish shells, all in the sack along with your bait. Um, so you're not trying to, it's not a hungry water in that way. You're not trying to draw loads of fish into your bait. You're trying to intercept them around the margins and you're doing it with just with little beds of bait. Um, lakes are so different, you know, I mean, this is just Cassian in question here, but other lakes like, you know, you've fished Shanticock a lot, Bob. Um, you know that better than most of us. And mm. it's probably a different situation there. Oh, much different, Steve. It, 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 Shanty, it, the problem we have with Shanty is it, is not so much the amount of bait we put in, it's, it's getting the bait to the water. Because when we turn, when we go to Shanty for three or four days, we, we take with us 100 kilos of bait. Wow, 100 kilos? 100 kilos of bait. And <laughs> you're, it's a totally different approach. We put out markers between, um, let's say, for instance, 80 metres apart, two markers, and put a line of bait across. And, uh, and we find that, that, that the fish will move on. And if, the, if, if you have a pair of anglers fishing side by side, mm. um, my runs will start as they come across that bait, that baiting situation. And, and as they work their way down the bait, so my, yeah. my power will come into the situation. And as it's cleaned up, the runs, the runs do stop. Um, we've never been able to put enough bait in the water to hold wow. them in that position. But what we have found is that they will come back um, at the same time mm. the next day and you can repeat it again. Um, we do top up as we have a fish. We, yeah. top, up, we top back up and, and, uh, and we seem to hold them a little bit longer that way. Um, but in, at, at night things get a bit different, a bit difficult because you can't yeah. get him back out at night or if there's a big wind blowing. Um, which happens at Shanty, you have to be a bit careful about. You can't get on the water yeah. um, because the yeah. wind has stopped you getting there. And that puts, that, that makes the, the situation uh, quite, quite different. Well, I mean, they, they do come in and mop up a big bed of bait. Oh, <laughs> yeah, the brighter, the bigger. Yeah, see, now that's a different situation. I mean, like one of the things that always interested me was like, you was on the very first trip to Reduta, mm -hmm. you know, and I mean, I've never been lucky enough to be at a lake when it's really first been discovered and, and you was lucky enough. I mean, what was it like in those days at Reduta? You know, at Reduta, um, well, mainly what we was doing was just baiting with maize because Reduta, the guy, Robert Reduta owns the lake, yeah. is a big Xander fisherman and he used to sort of go around baiting certain areas with maize because he found that that drew in the smaller fish which therefore would attract the Xander to feed on it and we was just baiting. Um, with the same sort of things that he was doing, or following the same sort of approach yeah. he was doing, baiting quite a lot with, with maize. It's, it's um, funny that maize is near enough on every lake that's ever been discovered. Maize is the first bait that's used yeah, on it, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, well, we went there with you know the most sophisticated of baits. You know, I went with Uchi, he took his yeah. top of the range baits, and we just couldn't buy a take on them. Really? They you know, didn't work? No, not very well. No. Not very well. We had one or two fish on them, I think, in total. You know, but most of them was, was, was maize, and I'd always say to anybody, if you're going to go to a water, a big water, especially if you want to do a bit of mass baiting, then take some maize with you. you know. We were on the second trip to, to Romania, and we'd, yeah. we'd sent a pallet, mm -hmm. a pallet load of boilies out, and we virtually left the pallet behind us, yeah. because the maize was so successful. We couldn't, we couldn't yeah. buy, a bait, buy a bite on a, on a boilie at the time. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's really interesting. See, for most of the time, I've missed that early part of the, the fishing. You know, I came to, to here uh, in 1986, and, you know, the fishing was already well underway by then, by about two years, and uh, I mean, you know, boilies work from the off then, straight away. Steve, I've, I've noticed this on this trip that the, 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 um, the size of boilies that you're using on Cassina, like 24 millers, yeah, which, which you mentioned is, is um, uh, akin to the size of object mm. that a carp would readily pick up. Um, just a question, particles on Cassin, do they do they play their part? Um, they have done, you know, all sorts of particles have played their part on here. Hemp is always, it's a good bait anywhere, hemp in it. Maize, I think, has more or less had its day. You know, it, it's an early 
bait and it, it sort of it's the first one to die if you like the first bait to, to yeah. go out the window um tiger nuts were really successful here um they, they still catch fish but uh, again the fish are very wary of tigers on here now mm -hmm. um I, i'm not a great fan of particles on here no um but you know i mean it's important that you mentioned about the size of boilies here because uh Oh, most of the fish have been getting, certainly the big fish, have all come to fairly big baits. Um, and we, we, you made the point that the natural food is either swan mussels or crayfish. Mm. So if that's the size of the natural food they're eating, then why think about using tiny little baits? You know, it's, it makes sense to use a big bait if it's what they're used to feeding on. Is it the same with Shantley, Bob? Or? No, no, it isn't. It isn't. Uh, uh, we, we, we've found that standard continental rigs, snowmen, etc have, have proved quite good so there is no reason why big baits wouldn't work but at the, at my experience is that snowman was, was so good that we carried on using it and it hasn't mm -hmm. hasn't waned yet it's still still a still mm -hmm. a good bait and the size we use 16 millers mm -hmm. um beds of 16 mil and, they, and it mm -hmm. works quite well uh, there, there's one important point about pop-ups i mean I, I don't know what you found but I've, I've always done well on snowmans i've always done well on bottom baits even better probably I've never done any good on pop-ups on Cassian. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I don't know why that is. They just don't seem very effective on a lot of these big waters. Not to start with, anyway. I don't know mm -hmm. what you found. To start with, well, I, I, I caught my, you know, my best fish from Reduta on a on a pop-up on the first trip. Right, it was yeah, about two inches off the bottom, maze. You know, I've, I have caught fish on on pop-ups here as well, mate. You know, I think mm -hmm. it's it's relevant to what you're confident in as well. I think. Maybe, yeah. I think also that what we, we we tend to forget when we compare these large waters is that Shanty, Biscaross are la large, shallow lakes. Mm -hmm. When we come to Cassine or um, Salaku, mm -hmm. we're talking about totally totally different ground underwater ground situations. Yeah, valleys these You're lakes are. We're talking about margins that drop that are dropping. It'd a be foot difficult to in, spread a big bend of bay here, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. You're talking and about a pop -up past is no longer bits. effective. Mm -hmm. Because the fish is see, right. seeing it as part of the background, rather than something that's sitting above a, above a lake bed. It's very true, yeah, true. That is true, yeah. You know, just something that, that springs to mind. Also, I'm just talking about the mass baiting, Bob, at, at Shanty. Um, I mean, Shanty Co is re renowned for having a massive head of fish. Yeah. You know, is it a case with yourself, in, you know, in your, uh, in your past on, on, on these big waters, that when you are fishing for a large head of fish, a large bed of bait is the best tactic to go in with, or or not necessarily the case? I didn't discover the large baiting system, other people did. And I have just adapted what, what mm -hmm. I've seen going on by other people to myself. And what I've discovered is that, that I, I'm, now I'm so confident that mm -hmm. when I go to Shanty, I will go with a, with a mass baiting program. Mm -hmm. um, it was only born, only came about by people catching more and more fish. And you, you start to realize that you just haven't got enough bait in the water mm -hmm. for, for the fish to go out and you lose your fish very quickly so yeah. you put a little bit more in and in the end um, it's a case where you say well I might as well start at the middle mm -hmm. and put mass amount of bait and bring the fish to you mm -hmm. um, position of bait in the lake made quite a lot of difference as well how we, it, you, you have a situation where if you draw a straight line between two two markers and, and spread your bait evenly between the two those, uh, if if one of the anglers decides, or by mis by mistake overcasts that line of bait, mm -hmm. um, it, the action stops mm -hmm. totally, and uh, you you must fish on that line, mm -hmm. through that line, never overcast, drop mm -hmm. your baits accurately. Yeah, interception of fish plays a, a major part, mm -hmm. but once they've discovered the bed they come back to it mm -hmm. every time. And will you be confident to sit on that bed of bait for two or three days before the, the fish move in or? Definitely, Simon, yeah. definitely. Um, they're so nomadic, they're, they roam so far, so fast. Yeah. Um, and they come, um, they come, they'll come upon them at some time. What is, what is noticeable um, at Shanty is the fact that uh, certain areas fish very well at certain times of year. Mm -hmm. And that gives me confidence Mm -hmm. When I go back to Shanty in September, I will aim to be in one area mm -hmm. because I know the fish are there. Mm -hmm. As the water levels are dropping, the, the stumps, the tree stumps are becoming uh, bare and, and they're, they're feeding on the craze. Mm -hmm. And as the level drops, we drop with it. Mm -hmm. um, we found that at Reduta, haven't we, Steve? Oh, certain areas. Yeah, Reduta with areas. I mean, yeah. yeah. 
certain areas like last, last October we fished a, an area didn't we where wasn't sort of known for producing fish in the winter or the, the colder months I should say mm. you know but we found uh, found a sort of isolated pocket of fish and that isolated pocket of fish turned out to be some of the originals didn't it rather than the, yeah, yeah, the stock mass, fish yeah. or the mass fish which sort of uh, made well, it a... I think with the uh, the baiting situations like you know what Bob was saying about redo I mean we saw the way Tim Paisley fish you know about putting out the 10 kilos to start mm. with you know it's hard for me to do it because coming from Cassian oh, where it's little beds of bait I, I found it quite hard to use put 10 kilos out in one go it takes a lot of confidence to do it doesn't it mm -hmm. And uh, but when it happens and the big fish come along, mm -hmm. then you realise it's what you need to do on some waters. It's not every water, is it? But no, no, but definitely not. I fished at Biscross this year, um, and we tried the uh, the big the big baiting program. Um, it didn't work for us. No, there's at definitely. It, it's no good going in with one fixed theory on all these big waters. It's no good thinking, right, it's a big water, this is the method to go in. Mm. You've got to be adaptable, haven't you? Yeah, which yeah. You, again, we spoke about doing your own work before. You've got to do a bit of homework yeah. and find out what you can do and, and can't do. Local knowledge is invaluable. Yeah. Um, yeah, people come simple. into the big waters, uh, the more you can find about before you leave is, mm. is totally invaluable. You know, uh, articles in Media Carp are well worth looking at, yeah. well worth picking up. And Carp World. <laughs> of course, carp will Simon. Well, it's true to say that every water's got information about it now. You know, in the early days, you was very much making it up as you went along, weren't you? But no, now, of you, you can read about every big water you're likely to fish. Somewhere you're going to find something. I think what's it. happened also, Steve, is over the years that the, 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 the pool of knowledge that we've gained from the French and from ourselves is, 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 is passed around so freely now that you can gain knowledge on large waters very, very quickly. Mm. And, it, yeah. and, it, and it short circuits the long, hard work that you have to put in. Mm. Yeah. Um, which, yeah. Which, you know, places, never had it so good, places like Gerard's and Pierre's at, at, at Shanty yeah. is, are, are invaluable, really. Yeah. One last question then, chaps. Um, you know, in England, you, you generally see on the small waters all this type of match fishing approach, you know, mm. small baits, method feeders, um, do these methods lend themselves well to, to the big waters in your mind or in your experience? I've, I've, the, the method, which I've used fairly extensively, I think only, only lend, in my experience, only lends itself to waters where fish are competing for food. Mm -hmm. And I found the method has been devastating. Um, on a couple of waters in England where we used it, it was a fantastic way of fishing. Mm. I don't think you could bring that, that system to Cassie. Right. Steve? No, I, I, big water fishing is a style all of its own, and uh, it's all to do with boats. You know, I mean, we don't do a lot of casting. It's all to do with boats, different baiting situations, big baits. You know, like, you know, but not in all situations. Um, but it, 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 I just think it is a style of fishing all of its own. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, mm -hmm. I think that's very important, Steve. The mm. style, the way you approach it. What you know, you have to get your head ready for these situations and come yeah. totally and utterly yeah, it's, prepared. It's mm -hmm. in your mind as much as having all the gear, isn't it? Totally yeah. agree, mate. Totally agree. Totally yeah. different, basically, the two English star fishing them. Oh, totally different. Yeah, yeah. but a, a wonderful way of fishing. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. I love it. We all do. It's uh, it's what I think. What it's what most most English anglers aspire to. It is it is the cream of their fishing. That's why they yeah. make the Mecca every year, or the people make the Mecca to Cassine yeah, every it's, year. It's like the ultimate challenge, isn't it, the yeah. big wars? I think so. Yeah. I think so. Very rewarding. Yeah. Can be very frustrating, but very rewarding. You probably wondered why we haven't shown uh, any casting on this film or indeed plumbing uh, with the marker float. Well, one of the things I should point out is that on these big continental waters, quite a lot of the time, you actually can't really use a marker float as we would do uh, because of the, some of the depths involved. I mean, here we're fishing 40 feet primarily. Uh, I've had fish down to 65 feet on this particular lake. And of course, you'd be there all day, uh, just letting line off, letting up a foot at a time. It's far quicker and more effective. Everybody does it to use a, an echo sounder. Consequently, the casting is also um, possible. I've had plenty of fish casting, don't get me wrong, but uh, you're far more precise using the echo sounder 
and using uh, the boat to drop your end tackle. Without a doubt, it's you know the, the thing that every European angler does. It, it's natural, and there's no uh, less credibility with the captures from doing this. It's, it's accepted in Europe because of the size of the waters we're fishing for logistics. Sometimes you're fishing 400 yards out, you know, and uh, with the best one in the world, you, you just can't fish on the distances. You can use drop-off leads uh, with weak links and everything, fishing from the boats. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the, the uses of the echo sounder. I'll show you how to, what I look for when I'm, I'm feature finding. You can see a lot more. You can make up the contours of the bottom in your mind and go for different things. You can find stumps, uh, avoid them if, if need be, uh, find hard gravel areas. There's so much information that you can get from the screen. Uh, you can go out in the middle of the night as well, which is another key aspect of this sort of fishing. Obviously, you, you won't be plumbing in the night, but you can use the sounder with the backlight and uh, it reveals a lot of information to you because you can get waters where you're not catching fish in the day. Uh, where you may be catching at night and go and find where they're feeding. Right, here we are then. Uh, got an Eagle Echo Sounder. We've come out at dusk, so basically because there's a little bit of light still, so you can see what we're talking about more. This is over the plateau that we're fishing at the moment. The predominant depth that the fish have been getting caught at is uh, 40 feet. We're looking for the grey line, basically. The grey line shows a hard bottom. See the band of grey across there? Well, that's hard gravel with a fine layer of uh, silt on the top. The thinner the black line over the grey, the thinner the silt is. And, when, and the, the narrower the grey band, that's, that's the harder it's more compacted, the, the gravel. So if you find somewhere with a thin band of grey, you know that you're on hard gravel there. And uh, we'll just see if we can find some fish. We're drifting out over the, uh, the plateau now. I'll go back in towards the bank. Hopefully we'll see some fishing 40 feet where I've been fishing. Uh, there's depths out to 120 feet, not too far out here, maybe 100 yards and you're in 120. You see it starts to shallow off now. There we are, the, the, there's less silt on that one and the gravel's more compact, ominously enough, and that's the area where we've been catching. Small fish there, probably bream. You can see there the silt's much, much finer as we get him back towards the bank. Looser gravel there as well. I'll take her back out again. I don't want to go too close to the bank because I've got lines running this out. Look at that there. You can see that the, the silt over the gravel there is extremely fine. So you'd be able to present the bait there really well. You can see how long plumbing would take like doing this. You'd be there forever. It's amazing you can go out and uh, see a completely different picture in the night. You can go places where you've seen no fish whatsoever in daylight and then they'll come in in the dark. Here's the feeding van. Simon and Steve have been fishing this area and uh, what they did tell me was they've not been seeing many fish on the sounder but they've been coming in you know around nine o'clock at night till five o'clock in the morning. So perhaps we're a bit early yet. Look at that there, 56 feet. As I say, I've caught them down to 65 feet in here, but that was in the winter. Steve, funny enough, on this lake, Steve reckons that in the winter the fish are in usually around 25 feet or less to 15 feet. And in the summer months, the fish are getting down in, into 40 feet to 50 feet. So it's obviously where the thermocline is and the, the, the nicest temperature, ambient temperature, so that they, uh, they feel comfortable there. Maybe the upper layers are too warm for them, or maybe there's more oxygen deeper down, I don't know. But there's definitely a preference. Look at this, 80 feet. <laughs> no fish whatsoever. Right, just, that's just to illustrate what we're dealing with. If I, I could go a bit further and uh, you'd be shocked. I'll show you some of the stumps that uh, I've been trying to avoid, to be honest. You lose a tremendous amount of tackle. Uh, I've been using weak links, which is four pound line, so that I can uh, lose the leads on a take. Small price to pay for a fish of the size of some of these in here, but uh, quite relevant. You usually follow the contours of the, uh, 
of the tree line and uh, you find lines of stumps, but this place is wooded all the way around, so, you know, the echo sound is the quickest way of getting some knowledge of what you're fishing to. You can see this is very rough ground, this. A lot of uh, stumps and rubbish on the bottom here. I'd be very loath to drop a bait on this. Well, you've got a thick black band that's very uneven, you're likely to lose tackle there. It's okay fishing near it because them areas do seem to attract fish at times. So you get crayfish and uh, other food builds up there, but if you can fish a smooth area near it, that's not so bad. But generally speaking, I'd avoid those areas like the plague. Right, here we can see uh, cut off tree stumps. Quite hard gravel underneath, and then there's the, the stumps that have been chopped away. So you'd certainly lose gear on this area. That's, that's a pucker bottom there, near the stumps. If you, if you wanted to fish near the uh, obstacles, that would be one area to look at. Very thin layer of silt, quite soft gravel underneath, but it'd still be good. There's an ominous lack of fish on this so far. As I say, it's been the best area on the lake on this particular trip for the boys. Just shows you, your initial thoughts were, if you were to come out, you could think that, uh, oh, there's no fish on the sound or I'll avoid this area. If you came through in the day, whereas if you, if you come through at night, you've a good chance of seeing them uh, at the feeding time. So it's always best to get a bit of background information and find out when the fish have been feeding, if you can, on the lake, and then use the sounder accordingly at key feeding times for locating feeding areas. Some people don't like fishing featureless areas like this, where there's uh, nothing remarkable to fish to. But in this instance, it's been working well. Because you've got so many deep areas of the lake, they'll come in and feed on these plateaus quite happily. So, horses for courses, really. If it was on a, a lake where you were getting very few depth variations, I'd look for uh, undulations on the bottom every time, especially steep plateaus. And I tend to fish on top of the plateaus if you're fishing. Uh, in the autumn in particular seems very good. One lake I go in Belgium, uh, it's 26 feet one side and uh, 19 to 20 feet on the other, and there's, there's an area that comes up within it's 13 feet under the surface. And if you get on top of that, that's absolutely perfect. I've had loads of fish doing that. Whereas if you fish the 24 feet or 20 foot area, you, you're lucky to get a run. One thing I should point out here is that we've we've not shown any weed beds or some of the other features that you can come across. And quite simply, there are very few weed beds uh, on this part of the lake. We're on the North Arm of Cassian because the depth, the weed just doesn't seem to take a hold and grow. So there we are, a brief insight into the use of an echo sounder. And as I say, just remember that point, get out in the dark if you're unsure. If they're feeding at night on the lake, you hear they're feeding at night. I would have a breeze round in the uh, dark, provided you've, you've got a little bit of knowledge of the lake. Check out some spots then. Day as well, as much as you can. My advice is to spend a lot of time looking first. I won't go far wrong. Gorgeous sunset there, isn't it? It's the beauty of fishing places like this. Some of the uh, scenery you see, it's not all about the fish. It's just one big adventure, really. It can be uh, heartbreaking at times, some of this fishing. Um, as well, you know, you think it's all gonna be uh, every throw of coconut, catching loads of big fish every trip and that. But it's not, it's uh, far from it. It can be very, very difficult and patchy. Certain parts of swims can sometimes produce fish. Like uh, Bob and I were fishing together. His side of the swim was fishing really, well, we're using the same tactics. His side was fishing reasonable and I've struggled. So, you know, it's all about, you need a little bit of luck, I suppose. And uh, hindsight's always useful. After the event, you store it in the old memory banks for a future reference, you know. Piece together all the bits and pieces. That's why Briggs is uh, the man on this sort of fishing. He's got 16 years of knowledge of this place.
look at the rig we're using here. Um, rigs haven't got to be anything too technical, but um, they've got to be able to cope with the situation you face with here. Now we've had a look around, the water's quite low, so you can see there's a lot of tree stumps and rocks showing. Uh, and that's the same sort of thing as what we've got under the water out there. So rig's got to be tough enough to cope with those. You know, a sharp rock could easily cut off a hook length. Hooks can catch up on tree stumps, so forth. You know, so we've got to try and overcome that. Now, starting at the, the hook end, we've got 24 mil rock hard boilie. I spoke about baits earlier. Um, only one of those on the hook. Now, you can drill them out. I can just about get a needle through them, so that's okay. Size two boilie hook. I'm using a Hutchinson Precision here, can be any hook. Um, the only thing I'd do is add a little bit of tubing down the shank of the hook. What that does is allow a bit of play for the boilie to ride up, should a fish try and blow the bait out. Just gives it a little bit of play and avoids the, the fish spitting the hook out, which they can do. Onto the hook length, 25 pound coated braid. Um, it could be any, I, I mean, I've used mono and all types of braid. This, just seems to be about the best of the lot. Very popular at the moment, great stuff that is. The lead, five ounce gripper lead. Now we're fishing on steep ledges here, uh, trying to keep it on top of rocks and stop it sliding down. These gripper leads just hold it nicely and do exactly what they say, they grip the side of a ledge. So five ounce just makes it easier to tighten up to. Four ounce is a little bit too light for some of these situations. Onto the main line here. 18 pound main line, got some tubing going about a foot 18 inches up there. Uh, no reason for that other than I like to put it on to protect the fish when you're playing them. You know, that just avoids lifting any scales off, anything like that. And then the final piece up the top here, got a table tennis ball. Now this has been drilled out with a bit of tubing placed through it. And importantly, the tubing's not straight, it's actually got a curve through it. Now what this does, when you drop the bait down, the line will run freely through that and it will rise up to the surface as the lead hits the bottom ping pong ball will rise up to the surface then when you tighten up the line come back to the bank and put your rod on the rest the tight line will keep the ping pong ball where it is now it will actually sink down but only to a certain level you will never keep it tight to the bottom and that's exactly what you want because it'll keep the line up over all the tree stumps and the rocks when you hook a fish that ball will rise up in the water and keep your line safe. So there we go, that's what we've been catching the fish on. We're about to start filming a bait piece about two hours ago, mate, and yeah. you were rudely interrupted <laughs> by a 44 pound common. I oh, know, it's unbelievable, wasn't yeah. it? Oh, I mean, yeah, we were sitting here, started to rain a little bit, we thought, well, shall we do it? All of a sudden, one of them's off, wasn't it? Yeah, And uh, a new PB common for the lake as well. Yeah, in 18 years, my biggest common out the lake, yeah. 44 pound, it was, ah, oh, I mean, stunning fight, stunning fish, mm. everything about it was stunning, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Catching a fish of that sort of stamp, a common out of here especially, is like almost the equivalent of catching a 60, because there's not many big commons over 20 kilos, are there? Uh, there, there's not a lot. I mean, there, there's the odd one. There's a couple of 50s in here. Mm. Literally, that's about it. Uh, fish over 20 kilos commons. Yeah, I mean, they are pretty rare, which is always strange because we call them commons, but they're pretty rare. Mm -hmm. um, it, oh, it's fabulous fish. Yeah, I mean, mm. it, I couldn't have asked for more. I'm mm. absolutely over the moon with that. So tell us about how you, how you caught it and what, what did it fall for, bait-wise? Well, it's funny, we, we were just going to talk about the bait and, you know, now we can come back to it, having caught that fish on it. Did you realise it was a, a big common when you, you was playing it, or I oh, should say a big fish anyway, whilst you were playing well, it? Well, not really, not to start with, because um, that was my furbish rod out, and where it's on a steep shelf, the fish immediately were going into the deep water. You mm -hmm. know, I'd, I'd had a 19-pound mirror not long before that, and to start with, it felt pretty similar. You know, it's very difficult to tell to start with. Um, for a little while it actually swung towards me as well and mm. you know as you gain in line you've got no idea what size it was mm. um, then as it actually got closer it started to make more in the deeper water and you know that was when the real fight started and mm. um, i don't know you know it's hard to tell what you've got but it was just that heavy weight mm. um, it wasn't shooting off on any really powerful runs but 
you know, those big fish are, yeah. are plodders, aren't they? You know, yeah. you've got that solid weight there, you can't move them, and they just ease off on their own and just take a little bit of line. And, yeah, it's great know, to it's watch, just, mate. Uh, great to catch all the man, but great to watch in a way. Yeah, it makes your old heart race a bit. Yeah, and top of course, marks. You know, we saw it, and whew, there it was, a big common, you know, out of the blue like that. Unbelievable, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah it's made the video for you, hasn't it? I can see. Ah, it's, it's made me trip, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hopefully made the video, but it's... Uh, Pretty special stuff, mate. Yeah. So, what did it fall for? You know, when people come to France for the first time, they think that you can use a cheap bait because French carp are easy to catch. You can just use a simple 50 50 bait. Did it fall for that type of bait, or was it something a little uh, bit sort of special? It, it, it's the biggest thing that, you know, where people go wrong coming abroad, and one of the biggest things. Mm -hmm. they, they got this thing uh, that foreign fish, fish in foreign waters, are easier to catch than anything else, so you don't need to use anything special. Mm -hmm. um, I've proved to myself, uh, and other people have proved to me over the years, the better the bait is, mm. the better the fish you catch. I mean, there's no two ways about it. I mean, these are pressured carp, aren't they? You know, these are very pressured carp in here. Um, mm. But it's not just here. It, you know, big fish do respond to good quality baits. You know, there you catch um, the fish. You know, for what food you give them. If you give them rubbish food, you catch the little tiddlers. Yeah. I mean, I've proved it to myself time and time again. I know you've had the same experiences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can catch fish on cheap food, you know, poor quality baits, but you very rarely get the good ones. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, these baits, uh, I mean, you know, talking about depths as well, the depths were important. We caught this one 40 foot. Mm -hmm. um, this was where we expected to catch them from the start. We was starting off at a 40 foot depth. Yeah. And again, it's proved to be right. We caught that fish in exactly 40 foot. Mm. Uh, and on these baits now, you know, I mean, you've brought these baits along and... Yeah, I mean, this is just one quality mix. You can use any quality baits. I know some of the lads mm. from Nutra Baits have been doing exceedingly well on Trigger down here. There's been some guys using yeah. Mainline, you know, good quality bait, NRG, Activate and stuff. This is this is Rod stuff, this is Hutchinson's bait, and this is MC Mix Addicted. And I know that since we started using it last year, uh, not just ourselves on this lake, there's there's quite a few locals that have been using it and they've been catching some good quality fish. Yeah. Joan, your wife, had a, a 60 last year on it, you've had several yeah. 50s. You've, you, you've had a very good couple of trips here in the last year, haven't you, using good quality well, bait? So. Well, like you've named a few of the top ones there and there, there's quite a few on the market. There's some good quality baits. It's not just one that, you know, that's the bait you've got to use. It's yeah. just, in general, a good food bait for the fish. Mm. Uh, and that's, that is the best one I've used, I must mm. admit, out of all of them. Mm. Um, but another important thing is that we've noticed it while we've been here. Uh, you don't just go in crash bang wallop, you know, as you can do, you can go in with any bait and hit a good fish straight away on the first day. But with a good bait, you're actually building up a swim. Mm -hmm. Now we started off a little bit slow, a couple of fish, uh, and then it's gradually built up and built up and we've got more and more action yeah. and the fish are getting bigger. Yeah. Uh, and that's what a good quality food bait does for you, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it builds up the swim. Yeah, we've seen Tim Paisley use that at, at Reduce, exactly. haven't we? You know, yeah, he goes there the first day, again. Yeah. second day, nothing's come along, third day, and then by day 10, he's had 740s and, <laughs> oh, no. and 60 and, and a 70. Think, my and God, <laughs> but, you know, when, you know, we followed his word about bait. He's drummed yeah. it into us over the years, hasn't he? Yeah, yes. And uh, he's, he's been right all along. Yeah, and, yes. Uh, you know, and it, exactly what he's taught us is what we've put in the action here, mm. and it's working for us, isn't it? Mm. Just talk about preservative, Steve, because this bait that we're using, it's it's preserved, isn't it? You know, when you come to France, maybe you've got two weeks. Some people don't like to use preservatives in baits. I'm one of those people. I'd prefer to extend the shelf life of the bait by using sort of air drying and stuff. Well, like you say, I mean, they're preserved, but they're preserved by air drying, yeah. you know, which is the important factor. They're not preserved by using an artificial additive. Mm -hmm. And that's the big difference. Um, I've no doubt in my mind that fresh bait that's preserved by air drying is a lot better. The fish know the difference. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's again, part of the quality of the bait. Mm -hmm. um, you know, bringing them abroad is the hardest bit. You know, these are, have come supplied from the bait company in paper bags, which is, is excellent for transporting them to the lake. You know, that keeps them dry, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. um, then one, once you're here, you know, we put them in these sort of bags, mesh bags that you can hang up in a tree. Um, I mean, we've had a storm today, so these have got a little bit wet, but hang them up in a tree. Mm -hmm. An hour later, they're bone dry and they're getting harder all the time. Mm. And how long will they last like that, you know, just in case there's some people out there that want to use them for, I don't know, come over overseas for a month or so? Is it possible well, that they'll stay that, that fresh? I mean, really, taking the moisture out of them, uh, they'll last indefinitely. Mm -hmm. um, they'll certainly last for a month. 
Mm. But you know, if you try and keep them too long, you're getting back to the old quality thing again. You know, if you're trying to use them six months later and a year later, you know, I mean, they'll still be, they won't go mouldy because you've taken the moisture out, but they mm. won't be a quality food bait. Mm. So, you know, always try and use them as fresh as possible. Well, mm. we do, don't we? We, yeah. we try and use the bait as fresh as we possibly can. Uh, and air drying is the best way that we know of, yeah. of preserving that freshness over a short period of time. Yeah. Now, we've looked at just boilies here. Now, obviously, Baits doesn't just involve boilies. There's there's particles. There's tigers. There's there's mm. peanuts. There's maize. There's hemp. There's even pellets and stuff. Now, yeah. do you take all this sort of stuff to the big waters? Do you use it on the big waters yourself, or, or are you strictly a boilie man? And if so, you know why are you? I'm mainly a boilie man because boilies have proved themselves to be the big fish baits over the years. Uh, particles. I, I very rarely use particles. I use tiger nuts because. A lot of these lakes, like now, if, if I want to fish shallow water, mm -hmm. um, you get a lot of the little catfish and crayfish, which absolutely annihilate your baits in no time. Mm. Uh, sometimes you've got no choice other than to use a tiger nut. It's the only thing that these little catfish... Even these hard eat. baits, you know, they'll still whittle they'll down still one of these. They'll still get through them, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, luckily, the depths we're fishing now, 40 foot average, um, we're okay at those depths. They're not being eaten by anything but the carp, which mm -hmm. is pretty handy, isn't it? Or the catfish, the big catfish. <laughs> the big catfish, is. yeah, saying that. Yeah, there's a few big catfish about, aren't there? Yeah, yeah. So have you, how so, big was that one you had last night? Oh, I had a 40 the other day and then a 56 yesterday, one of the nuisance yeah. things, though. <laughs> um, so, I mean, these, these, the press and shot won't go down to sort of what, 35, 40 foot, or? Um, I, I'll, normally, you're pretty safe over 30, 35 foot. Yeah. Um, you still get the odd ones down there, but it's more of a big problem when you're trying to fish in the shallows, uh, 10, 15 foot. Yeah. That's when they're a real nuisance. Now, hook baits then. Um, you can do all sorts of things now with boilies for hook baits, can't you? You can even use, some people use beads and, you know, rock hard beads, drill a hole through it, and that overcomes the, the crayfish and the, the poisson char, but you can also buy these boilie cases, you can buy uh, women's tights and, and mesh the baits <laughs> up. You know, are you a fan of any of those? Or oh, I love what? women's tights. <laughs> you wear them, dear. <laughs> I'm going to move my bivvy back. I think, mate. <laughs> no, but seriously, um, I mean, there's all sorts of, you know, tights. They will keep the crayfish off to a certain extent. Um, mm. I mean, there's a new method now using shrink tubing, where you can, say, get a, a 30 mil section of shrink tubing and shrink it around the boilie, and that yeah. gives it a hard outer coating. Yeah. Um, there's all sorts of things, but. There's nothing like just a normal boilie as you use it out of the bag. Yeah. Um, if you can get the carp feeding at a depth which you're not going to get any nuisance species like we've got here, then yeah. that's perfect. Because uh, if you're expecting the carp to eat these baits we're throwing out, mm -hmm. then using one on the hook as well, you, you know, it can't be better than that. Mm -hmm. That's the way I look at it. What size boilies? Um, 24 mil bottom baits. Yeah. For this single 24 mil bottom baits. I mean, something I've noticed. I did try using a double 24 mil bottom bait, mm -hmm. um, and actually was getting more smaller fish like that. Yeah. You know, lower 20s, upper doubles. Uh, is that uh, something you found just at Cassian, or is that the same at big waters like Reduta, Rivers, Shanty, etc.? Um, that's more to here, really. Um, I haven't really used it enough on other waters to notice the difference, but I certainly noticed the difference here. So mm -hmm. most things you know, transfer across to other waters as well. Yeah. So, oh, you know, I don't know why, but the bigger fish um, seem to go for the single bait, whether yeah. it's because it's identical to all the freebies and they're mm. a bit older and wiser, maybe. Yeah. That's something I know yeah. Alan Dano's touched on, the, you know, the successful Belgium angler. He's talked about using single boilies with a bigger fish. He's also touched on roughly what you did, and that's that boilies seem to be the bait for big fish yeah. on big waters. You take a lot of particles there, they're great for putting a mass baiting situation yeah. out there and you can you can attract a lot of fish into your swim, but mainly they're the, the shoal fish rather than the bigger fish. Yeah. Would you agree with that, yeah? Yeah, I would. You know, the big fish, these these fish, they've been around for years. They're the oldest, the biggest, the yeah. hungriest sometimes. They, they know what good food is. They know what's good for them. Yeah. They, they have to live by what they eat. So, right. you know, they don't get, get to that sort of size by eating rubbish. They mm. know what's best for them. So, so one, one last thing then, mate, before we move on. Um, flavours. Are you a big yeah, fan of point. attractor baits or low-level flavours for these big waters? Chantico is supposed to be a relatively easy, mm. easy venue. Would you go in there with a different flavour to you would do at, at Cassian based on 
the natural foods that they're feeding on or based on the pressure that the fish are under or yeah no it's, it's a very good point flavor because we always use flavors in our baits mm -hmm. well, you know it's, it's something we all do um, but high levels of flavors seem to really go against you you know especially here i've noticed it over the years you put a high level of flavor in your baits mm -hmm. you, you're on for a disaster um a disaster in that you know not just that you won't be catching the, the bigger fish but is that uh, also fish. attracting the smaller fish as well, you know, as in the Prussian shark, the high levels uh, of flavour? No, I mean, I mean, as far as carp goes, it seemed to really put them off altogether. Yeah. Um, I only noticed this when I was actually leaving my baits out for two days at a time. If yeah. I had high flavour levels in my baits, I would only get takes on the second day that they was in right. the water once, you know, the flavour had diluted out. Yeah. Um, so I halved my flavour. And I was getting bites straight away then. Mm -hmm. So now, I still like to use flavours. I mean, monster crab and shellfish, sensible. Yeah, you know, they're renowned good big fish catchers. But just don't overdo it. Just low levels. It mm -hmm. doesn't have to smell good to us. It's, it's the carp that you want to catch, not us. Mm -hmm. So just low levels and good quality. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the end of the trip. We're just looking for a few albums here of the old Cassian fish from the past. There's yeah. no doubt that Cassian is uh, such a historic water on, on world terms. It's, a, it's an amazing water. Uh, and this guy here with me, Benoit, uh -huh. not only a good angler, but... Uh, I, I try. Yeah. <laughs> but you know so much of the history of uh, yeah. Cassian now. And uh, I mean, the, the first thing I suppose I'd like to ask is, how many original fish do you think are still here? Yeah, it's difficult to, to know, but uh, I think uh, many fish uh, uh, who come from the first generation dead. Um, and in these two albums, uh, maybe you can have uh, maximum 20 fish uh, who come from the first generation. And, and among those, a uh, half moon, Obelix, maybe yeah, uh, some of the yeah, more well-known fish. Two famous fish uh, for, uh, from the first generation, Half Moon, Obelix, and maybe uh, ten other fish. Ten other fish, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, many, many fish dead, and we hope for the, the second generation and the third mm. generation uh, to have some good fish uh, in Cassia. Yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, talking about good fish, there, there is so many big fish yeah. uh, in the lake now. Do you think maybe it's possible there's more big fish here now than at any time in the yeah. history of the lake? Uh, uh, in this two album, maybe uh, you have uh, 150 fish, over 20 kilo. Yeah, it's amazing, uh, isn't it? <laughs> yes, uh, many of these fish, their fish uh, uh, come from the second generation. Um, and we have a, a, a big, uh, R rate? Um, yeah, yeah, a growth okay. rate, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, um, we can hope uh, many fish over 25 kilo for the, the next year. Uh -huh. Yeah. And uh, perhaps one of the most important things, mm -hmm. your Cassian Club. Yeah. Now, uh -huh. I mean, the, the Cassian Club yeah. is designed to help anglers, mm -hmm. but also mm -hmm. help the carp, which yeah. is, uh -huh. and the lake, which yes. is very important. Yeah. I mean, uh -huh. can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah. Yes, the, the club Cassian Passion uh, uh, is uh, to protect fish and environment. It's very important because uh, many fish are dead because uh, uh, many anglers uh, visit Cassian just for big fish and don't respect uh, uh, yeah. fish and environment. Uh, some hangar uh, arrive uh, without a uh, mat and there's yeah. many damage uh, for fish. In the general world, okay, you, you can saw uh, many photos about big fish uh, who were caught uh, 10 years, 15 years ago and all the fish are clean. And now... And it's when a different you, story yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, it's a different story. Uh, Maybe 50% of uh, big fish uh, have, uh, have some damage. Yes, in the tail or in um, 
We yeah. would call on as many problems because... Uh, so it's the club yeah. will be a great thing for the lake in the future. And, you know, I mean, you'd advise anyone, yeah. I, I've joined the club, you know, because I think it's good for the future of the lake uh -huh. and the future of the fish, yes. which is yes. so important. Yes, it's very important. Uh, uh, I think the, the, the most, the, the beautiful year uh, for Cassian, it's the future. Because yeah. m many fish uh, between uh, 15 and 18 kilo, and if now all the anglers respect this fish, uh, you can hope m many, many good fish, but now uh, there is a problem. There is a problem because uh, not yeah. all anglers respect really the fish and come just for a big fish. And, um, it's, yeah, it's so the, we, the, have, we have to educate yeah. the people uh -huh. and the, the club will go a long way for this. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, Benoit, it's been nice speaking to you. Hi, thanks. Fantastic, mate.